it's great to be here. Uh, the title of this talk is somewhat aspirational. So it's sort of more what we want to do as opposed to what we have done. So if you don't like what I'm, what I'm sort of, if you don't like what we are doing, that's terrific because then you can come and help us do it better. <laughs> it's joint work with uh, many, many people. Uh, Tanya Aitamurto, uh, Pranav Dandekar, Anilesh Krishnaswamy, Ellen uh, Landermore, David Lee, and Sukhal Sak Sakshivon. <laughs> so the basic problem is uh, decision making at scale. That's essentially what democracy is. You are making a decision at scale. And the question is, can we do it differently now? Or should we do it differently now, now that we have all these internet enabled systems? <laughs> so if you have a simple problem like, is it Obama or Romney? It's, it's very easy. You can just do a simple poll. But suppose you have a more complex decision, how can we cut the US budget deficit? <laughs> and you ask that question on any blog, let's say you go to a blog and you say, well, how do we cut the, the US deficit? <laughs> and someone is going to start calling you a communist, someone else is going to call you, is going to start calling you like a, um, a blood sucking capitalist, someone will sort of start to bring that death panels in and very soon they'll be shouting at each other. And uh, I can guarantee that a coherent solution to the US budget deficit is not going to emerge. So the question is, how can we make decisions at scale in the face of polarization and extreme opinions? Free from discussion boards often degenerate into vitriol. And so we need more structured modes of interaction with provable properties. And so, so that's what we're trying to develop. <laughs> We've had uh, some successes on the ground. We did a large uh, pilot in the city of Vallejo this month, last month, which was interesting because Vallejo is, is a city that emerged from bankruptcy. So trying to figure out how to make decisions as a city is something that's uh, part of the healing process. <coughs> so as a warm up exam, and so, so once again, uh, just to emphasize this again, what you're going to see is more like sausage being made. So this talk is mostly aspirational. We have various pieces and each of these pieces is interesting in its own regard. And uh, trying to fit them together into sort of some sort of a seamless uh, decision making a scale platform is, I don't think we are very close to it yet. So here's a one more example. It's one of those examples where we have uh, a mode of interaction that we really, really like, but we haven't been able to prove much about it. <laughs> so let me just describe the, the, the mode of interaction. So this is at this point, this is more of an open problem. So normally people put open problems at the end. I thought let me put one at the beginning. <laughs> so the example is suppose you have many, many users, many, many proposals. You want to do something completely unstructured. And the unstructured thing could be how should we organize this HCI seminar? <laughs> or what should SCI group do next year? It could be anything. <coughs> a user can make as many proposals to solve a complex problem as she likes, like one, two, three, a hundred. <coughs> Each user has only one vote. She can change her vote as often as she likes. <coughs> and a proposal that ends up with K votes get K square tickets to a lottery. <coughs> so this is a fairly simple, it's a fairly simple game. <coughs> so what does this goal, what does this game do? It rewards consensus building. So for example, imagine that A, B and C <coughs> have uh, some preferences and their preferences happen to be very close to each other. And so they, all of them have one ticket to the lottery. If they come to a compromise position, if all three of them vote on the same proposal, then together they'll have nine tickets to the lottery as opposed to three tickets to the lottery. <laughs> so in our simulations, in our small experiments, this works very well. Yeah. And the question and the open problem is, can we characterize the Nash equilibrium of this game? And to begin with, can we do it just for grading? I'm going to explain what I mean just for grading. <laughs> so, <coughs> so this is an example of a structured interaction. Okay. Uh, and so the structure here is that you're voting for something. In general, if you just allow, if you, if you allow people to vote for something and you do majority rule, then there's several problems with majority rule. First of all, the minority is not empowered. Okay. So if 60% of the people think one thing, what well, the remaining 40% think is completely irrelevant. Okay. That doesn't happen in this game. If 60% of the people are here and 40% are there, those 40% still have a small chance of their ideas coming up. <laughs> then <coughs> what if there's no majority? In this case, if the 30% of the people who really believe in one proposal and everyone else is all over the place, then those 30% of the people are almost guaranteed to win. So imagine you have a population of a million people, 300,000 of them strongly believe this is the right thing to do. Everyone else can't agree among themselves. Right? Then this, when, you, when, you take, when you take the square, those 300,000 people are almost guaranteed to win. <laughs> so the way we tested this was in the form of a small game. And the game is what we call the grading consensus game. And in this game, 
what we ask students to do is to decide how to allocate weights to the first three homeworks and the midterm of a class. Okay. So students have already done like the, they've already done the three homeworks, they've already done the midterm, and the question is how do you assign, how do you decide what the weightage of each of these things is? And the total weight is fixed to be 50 percent. Students could propose whatever they want. Okay. <laughs> so, th so that's the that's where the non-structure or the complexity of the problem comes in. So somehow the goal is to not have to model the problem completely in its whole generality. Okay. So for each of these problems, we don't want to go and do something separate for grading, something separate for budgeting. So can we have something more general? So the students can propose whatever they want and then they can go and change their votes as often as they want and the game ended at some point <laughs> and then each proposal consists of four values corresponding to the weight for each assignment and the exam in the final grade the sum to 50 percent and for each proposal you can view the number of current votes on it and its current probability of winning <laughs> and at the end sort of we run this lottery at some point the, the game ends and we run this lottery. <laughs> Or no, so, so uh, right, so right now you sort of right away as soon as they define this mode of interaction, you immediately get into like the first algorithmic problem there. How do you decide when to end? <laughs> yeah. How do you visualize the other proposals and the amount of votes they all currently have? Um, you just show them everything. <laughs> it's a full information like, game. Like, sort of according to popularity. You, 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 can, you can show them. It's a full information game. So I forgot the password. Okay. <laughs> But the full information game, so when you get in, you see all the proposals that have been made, you see all the votes on every proposal, you see the chances of every proposal winning, so we do not even expect you to do the quadratic thing and then take divide the ratio. <laughs> you are told what your current expected score is because we know your grade <laughs> and you are told what your score would be if you move somewhere else, <laughs> expected score. So every, it is a full information game, there is nothing is being hidden from anyone. <laughs> so it is not like one of those games where we sort of. We, we really want to mimic this democratic process, right? We want people to have all the information. We're not trying to hide anything from anyone. <laughs> okay. And so it worked well. Uh, everyone did best response. <laughs> a clear, clear uh, majority emerged. <laughs> the majority that emerged was in the best interest of sort of the, the people who voted for that. <laughs> and uh, so the game was actually, as, as an experiment, was very successful. The instructor hated it because <laughs> because the outcome was all the vote all the way on the first homework, <laughs> and nothing on homework two, three, or the midterm. <laughs> <laughs> Were you the instructor? No, this is Ramesh. Ramesh is the instructor. <laughs> so, so this is an example of what I mean by structured interaction. Okay, so that's the kind of thing we are shooting for. We are shooting. We, we ultimately do want to build these systems. We do want to deploy them in practice. <laughs> and I'm going to show you some example deployments. <laughs> but we want to do more than that. We want to understand exactly what these systems are. Are we are we confident we are extracting the right thing? Can we analyze uh, uh, what the what the behavior of these systems is going to be at scale? And mostly. How do we cope with the fact that when you go to vote, you are voting on a small number of things. You are typically voting among three candidates for president. In, in, in democratic decision making, we want to get it to the point where everyone has an opinion. So if you have a million voters, you also have a million proposals. And so in, in, that, in that kind of a setting, can you still make decisions in uh, some systematic uh, formal fashion? So here is the first uh, technical thing, I am gonna, I'm not going to describe the technical part in too much detail, I am going to just show you an example of how the technical part ends up being very useful. <laughs> it is uh, crowdsourcing of participatory democracy. So in participatory democracy what happens is, this is a picture that David found, it is very appropriate. Normally think of democracy as you are going to go and you are going to elect a set of representatives and those representatives are actually going to go and make a decision. But what if you wanted to make decisions directly as a, as a community? <laughs> so uh, what if you want to just like all of you? Uh, if you are in a city and there are 20,000 of you, could all 20,000 of you collectively brainstorm about what the right thing for the city to do is okay, and then collectively decide on a course of action. Okay. That is a little bit different from the proposition system. In the proposition system, essentially it is true that you are directly voting on something, but what you are voting on is just two or three things which have still been set by a committee somewhere. So participatory democracy is a process emphasizing the role of citizen involvement in uh, political decision making. And so what we would like to do in this setting is we would like to have the have a process which allows us to get to some nice social choice function. So what, what does it mean? Imagine you have all these proposals, imagine you have these three voters and these three voters rank all the proposals in some order. 
So we are given the first one ranks them as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The second one does the same thing. The third one has a different ranking. So a social choice function is something that takes all these rankings and outputs a single ranking. So that's that's the typical definition of a social choice function. <coughs> now the problem, so that's the typical way in which people have thought of social choice functions. The problem of course is when you have as many proposals as you have voters okay, or when you have like dozens of proposals, you have like 100 proposals or 10,000 proposals, then it's unreasonable to expect <coughs> any user to come up with a full ranking of all the proposals. And so what you would like to do instead <coughs> is to elicit their preferences without asking them to do a full ranking. And the way you would like to do this, for example, could be just ask them to make a comparison. So you could just ask each user to do a small set of comparisons. <coughs> and the question then becomes, can we find the output ranking? Assume there's a fixed, there's an output ranking that we'd like to get, okay, uh, which is determined by the social choice function we want to implement. Can we find it with a small number of comparisons? <coughs> and the many negative theoretical results. So for example, the main one is Kunizer and Sandholm. We said that if you have m proposals and n voters, and you want to extract what's called the border rule. Okay. <coughs> And so the border rule just says uh, if you arrange everyone, if you take all the rankings and you look at any proposal and look at its average rank in all these proposals, that's your border rank. <laughs> so your border rank is just the average rank that you have in the ranking made by every voter. Okay. So is the idea clear? You have a bunch of proposals, you have a bunch of voters. Each voter is, imagine each voter is ranking all the proposals. <laughs> then the average rank of a proposal across all the voters is the border rank of that proposal. <laughs> so, so the question is you want to extract this border rank, how many comparisons do you actually need to make? And there is a lower bound by Konezer and Sandom which says that you really need n times m times log m comparisons. <laughs> now that is not a big deal if m the number of proposals is small okay? because n times m times log m really means that any individual only has to make m log m comparisons. Okay? <laughs> So if m is small, like m is like 5 or 6, it's okay. You can just ask them to make 10 comparisons and you're done. <laughs> but what if m starts to become 20, 30, 40, 50, 80, right? Even around 20, it starts to become very hard to expect people to rank 20 things, uh, comp uh, produce a full rank list of 20 things. Okay? <laughs> and so what we observed was that even though these things are, <laughs> sorry, so you need n times m times log m to do Borda. You need n times m to do Condorcet. And Condorcet is a very nice concept. A Condorcet winner of a vote <laughs> is somebody, is a proposal who would beat every other proposal in a pairwise vote. <laughs> so if there's Condorcet winner, and let's say, uh, let's say you are the Condorcet winner, that means if there's an election between you and any one other person, you're going to win. <laughs> so Condorcet winners are very good. When they exist, Condorcet winners are like the right, is, is the right notion of a winner, except that it may not always exist. So there exist situations when A will beat B, B will beat C, C will beat A if you have a pairwise election. <laughs> so whereas Borda ranking is always well defined. So if a Condorcet winner exists, then uh, Konezer and Sandum said that you cannot extract a, a Condorcet winner even if it exists using less than n times m comparisons and again that's going to be too much, yes? It seems like what you're saying that it's assuming that it's easier to do m pairwise comparisons than to rank n things. Um, well, it is a negative result. Is that a, yeah, I mean that so, it, so it is saying that we need to do at, at least as many comparisons, which really essentially says that you might as well just ask me to do a full ranking. Right, right. Because if you, if you take any individual, because the amount of work any individual is doing is m log m. In m log m comparisons, we can sort. So saying that you need m log m comparisons per user is essentially the same as saying that there is nothing you can do using comparisons. You might as well ask users to do a full ranking. Yeah. So, so you are not really getting anything by comparisons uh, if you are looking for exact results. <laughs> but what we showed was that uh, if we want to approximate the outing, uh, output ranking with a small number of comparisons. So we are happy to say okay well we do not really want an exact answer. We are happy if we get an approximate ranking. Then some, some, suddenly it turns out that you can do much better. The factor of n goes away completely. <laughs> so you only need m over epsilon squared log m over delta uh, comparisons. I'm going to explain what epsilon and delta are in a few seconds. But if you were to ignore epsilon, log m, and log of 1 over delta, which is what you would do if you take like any algorithms class, then you're left with just m. <laughs> okay. And so m is the number of proposals. 
so which means that the average number of uh, comparisons that a, a voter has to do is essentially going to zero. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing which, if if m is comparable, oh, sorry, if m is comparable to n, then the average number of comparisons a voter has to do is still remains small. <laughs> so that's the kind of protocol that could potentially scale to having uh, many many proposals and many many users. <laughs> yeah. So just defining. <laughs> Uh, the border winner. Let s of x is the number of comparisons won by a particular proposal x. Okay. A border winner is just the one that maximizes s of x. Okay. Saying that you're looking for, saying that you're looking for someone with the highest border count is the same as you're looking for someone with the highest average rank, which is the same as maximizing someone, maximize the person who's going to win the highest number of comparisons if all the comparisons are going to actually get made. So the border winner is just the one that wins the most comparisons and an epsilon border winner is someone who wins at least 1 minus epsilon as many comparisons. <laughs> and so if we randomly sample comparisons, just ask people to, to randomly uh, compare different things, <laughs> then the algorithm of eliciting border is just you pick two things at random, you show them to a voter, <laughs> the voter sort of uh, chooses one versus the other, then you go to another voter. You pick another random set of two things, you ask them to compare those. So there is no correlation to ask a voter to compare two things, you are picking the two things you are comparing completely at random. <laughs> and so the theorem is that order m over epsilon squared log of m over delta comparisons are sufficient to find an epsilon border winner with probability at least 1 minus delta. <laughs> so that gives you some hope that you can actually scale these, this comparison based system to a situation where the number of proposals and the number of people are comparable to each other. <laughs> so this is independent of n and so if m is less than n then this is like log m comparisons per person not m log m comparisons per person but log m comparisons per person. <laughs> so we took this idea and we applied it to uh, an experiment in Finland where uh, uh, we wanted to crowdsource uh, their off road traffic law. So a big chunk of Finland is under ice for a big chunk of the year. So you wouldn't imagine this to be true, but where you can drive your snowmobiles is a hot button political issue in Finland, much the same like in, in the areas around Yellowstone in the US. Okay. <laughs> and so uh, our collaborator uh, <laughs> Tanya Aitamurto had already extracted uh, a bunch of proposals made by uh, a bunch of sort of uh, snowmobile enthusiasts, environmentalists, uh, landowners in Finland. And then we ran a comparison based process, also a ranking based process, we just, we just asked people to randomly compare different things <laughs> like location of routes, what would be the best way to situate snowmobile routes and we would just completely randomly pick two things out and give it to them and we asked them to compare, uh, one idea could be an undeveloped land beyond residential area should be made available as free riding zones, the other should be there should be more routes in the eastern and northern parts of Finland. And it's a bit of an unfair thing to do, it's like a very apples and oranges comparison, but we just like picked two things in random, asked them to compare them and they said, uh, they, they said either this is better or that is better. <laughs> we also occasionally asked them to rate things, we said like here is an idea, give it a rating between 1 to 5 stars. <laughs> As it turns out it worked very well. So first of all, I am not going to get into the detail of this plot except to show that it exists, that whatever I was saying about extracting epsilon uh, approximation actually works in practice. The you can plot as you get more and more votes, you can see how what your approximation of the border score is, and you see it decreasing pretty much according to the formula that we we had proved. <laughs> but equally interestingly, what we found was that since we also have these ratings, one thing that we found was that uh, whenever we go to talk to so even when we go and talk to a city or a government and we say we want to do this kind of a crowdsourced law for you, the first thing they say is well, <laughs> the first thing that they want is that they want these results segregated by demographics. So they want to understand how did women vote, how did children vote, how did blacks vote, uh, how did whites vote, how did, how did F someone with a college education vote. <laughs> and so what we realize is that sort of while all of that is interesting, right, what is more interesting is just completely forget all of that and what we did was we just looked at people's ratings and based on that we established a similarity function between people just based on how they are voting. <laughs> and so, so if, if for example, <laughs> Uh, you and I vote in very similar ways then we will be sort of, uh, then uh, our score will be higher. And based on that we clustered all the users <laughs> and we clustered all the users we found that 
there is a majority component out there and there is a minority component out here it is a very clear it is a very clear cluster <laughs> and the majority voted one way but the majority had a very clear vote I mean this is a very clear winner by the majority and the minority voted another way <laughs> and it is a, a very clear winner in the, in the minority <laughs> and these kinds of things are very this kind of minority majority opinion is very hard to extract without this kind of unsupervised clustering. And the reason is when you are carving things out by demographics, <laughs> you are sort of imposing your own notion of what a minority is. <laughs> you, might, you might believe that this, this particular so segment of society is a minority. <laughs> Whereas uh, what might actually happen on the ground is very different. So for example, <laughs> the minority cluster here is uh, women, environmentalists and landowners. <laughs> and there is no way you would have thought of that as a minority cluster, right? Because like half the people are women and then on top of that you are adding landowners. So, how could that be a minority? <laughs> but especially, especially because we are doing these things, especially as you build these systems which are going to be primarily on the internet and they are going to be more increasingly respondent driven. Somehow your old notions of minority which is let us take a demographic, demographic cut and try to define minorities that minorities by a demographic cut <laughs> become quite redundant because the people who would, the people who would vote <laughs> on this platform are people who sort of really care about the issue and maybe snowmobile users care more about the issue than uh, and maybe snowmobile users are all men, all men and those kinds of things are very hard to know before the fact. <laughs> so one thing to remember as we, as we do more and more of these respondent driven crowdsourced uh, democratic processes is that we have to have <laughs> instead of just targeting them by old notions of demographics we have to look at the data and then target them according to how they and then cluster them according to how they vote. <laughs> so the other the other thing that became that was very exciting and the, and the reason I wanted to describe this uh, board account is well it turned out to be really useful in something else that we want to do <laughs> and that is participatory budgeting yeah. Uh, sorry on the thing about demographics <coughs> is that a problem in practice though because of privacy around <laughs> So there might be a big problem if you want to understand, if you want to associate uh, personally identifiable data with a node in the network. <laughs> so that is something we could do in this case because we had sort of it was done an exper experiment right. But just knowing the way people voted, I am not seeing a big privacy concern there. So if there is no, if there is no connection between an identity and your vote, then it seems like, then it seems like, uh, so then, then what you essentially. The, the, the data that we need to do this clustering is just the entire set of votes you made and has to have no personally identifiable, uh, identifiable information about you. <laughs> is it just that you want to identify a minority here or do you want well, to connect? So in this, in this case we went a little bit further and we said the minorities were sort of these demographic groups but in general there is no reason to do it. <laughs> so for example if you think of some of these processes are mandatory in the sense that they are binding the outcome that comes from them is binding on the city or binding on the state. This particular crowdsource process was advisory. <laughs> so especially if you are running an advisory process, it is very important to go to them and say well instead of just saying well this is the guy that won, it is very, it is much more informative going to say this is the guy that won but by the way there was a clear minority of let us say 25 percent people who thought in this other way <laughs> and just that, that sort of that data driven cut on, on minorities is uh, what what becomes essential as you start to do these things not in a way in which you are calling everybody or everybody is going to a poll but where people can go to the internet side and vote. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any, do you get any pushback with people concerned about control? It's like we can tell you hey with you know relatively high probability we will get you the right answer um, when it is a very high stakes decision like this do people ever chafe and just say like oh we would rather do the the slower, the, the more boring thing that requires more work to be absolutely certain we got it right or do people or you know, do these countries or these cities seem to be relatively So, right? the pushback that we get is more that people have to understand what is happening. <laughs> so, the pushback that we get is not so much around uncertainty uh, because people sort of already understand with all this polling people already understand it is like margin of errors and so on. The big push that we get is if, if you are running a process, it should be clear to someone how their vote could potentially change the outcome. So, for example, if you are doing, uh, uh, when, when you are voting in a, for Obama versus Romney, it is very clear, one you vote and Obama's tally goes up by one, Romney's tally does not go up by one. 
if it is a comparison between uh, candidate X and candidate Y and then it is going to go into some kind of a board account, then it is not transparent to the, the voter what their vote really meant and that has been a bigger pushback for us than uh, the uncertainty in the process. Are there <laughs> ways to explain that kind of thing that makes them feel more comfortable? I think there is a bit better interfaces for which we need a lot of help. <laughs> so, for example, the kind of so 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 the kind of interface I'm not describing it in this talk because we we don't have it deployed anywhere yet. <laughs> but the kind of interface that I think we'll ultimately need to build is some sort of like an ESPN like interface. So I don't know if you have seen in ESPN they do this voting, <laughs> and in ESPN there is this voting where they say rank all the teams, and you have like thirty slots, and you can go and put whatever team you want in whatever slot. You don't have to fill all the slots. You can stop wherever you want. <laughs> but even though the exact formula might not get disclosed by ESPN or the exact formula might be some complex weighted thing. Just the fact that you know that there is this ranking that you are submitting makes people say well I am submitting a ranking and the ranking is going to affect and then ultimately the ranking is going to come out and somehow at that point people are, <coughs> I, I, I do not know maybe the psychologists in the audience who know what the difference between that and comparisons is <laughs> because they are both opaque formulas. But the fact that you submitted a ranking and the output is going to be a ranking somehow makes users comfortable uh, feel like they understand how their vote is going to affect things. But when they are doing a comparison and the output is going to be a ranking, then they are a bit more, uh, it is more nebulous to them. <laughs> so, the next thing I want to talk about is participatory budgeting and knapsack voting. Uh, there is a big nationwide push now for participatory budgeting. The, the White House has uh, uh, made a proclamation last year saying that they want to see more participatory budgeting in more cities. <laughs> and so, what happens in participatory budgeting is that uh, in any city or any community a certain amount of money gets set aside and then the citizens of that community or the residents of the community would come together, they would decide on 15 or 20 or 50 or 10 proposals to put on the ballot and then there would be a city wide election <laughs> and whatever projects win would essentially get assigned that money. <laughs> and uh, uh, residents love it, politicians also love it. Because there are lots of decisions for which where, a, where the only, if, if you are trying to sort of decide whether to put a fountain in this park or a bench on that bus stop, <laughs> it is not like the politician has any vested partisan interest, right? it is not like the Democrat is going to say do this, they are going to say let us do that. And so, it is not, it is not something out where there is, it is not a, a non-political decision. So, politicians love doing this kind of stuff for non-political decisions, right? there is no, there is no chance of them being, of anyone, uh, there is no chance of anyone being called partisan because you put. Uh, a fountain here as opposed to uh, <coughs> a bench there. And when they decide, they get criticized. When the community decides, the community decided, right? It's nothing to do with them. <coughs> so it's something which actually politicians actually like. <laughs> and so the way they do it is by approval voting. Uh, the voting itself is approval voting. What that means is every voter chooses K projects for a fixed K, and the project that gets the most votes get Im gets implemented. And so our tool was used as a digital voting platform in Chicago's 49th ward and in Vallejo. I'll just show you a quick uh, demo. So first of all, so this, this is sort of probably more of an SCI like thing, right? So what, what, what this, so the way they are in this process is that they have a paper ballot and this digital ballot and voters can choose to use whichever one they want. So we are constrained to do, have the same kind of format as the paper ballot. But you can already see that this is uh, much more informed than the paper ballot. So for example, they have street resurfacing, sidewalk repairs and street lighting. <laughs> and so if you click on a street resurfacing option a map pops up right on the map you can see exactly which streets are getting resurfaced. <laughs> and so <coughs> this goes to one point, uh, one pushback against digital tools at least in the, in the, in the, in the democracy space is that uh, there is a digital divide. And what we are trying to tell cities and foundations and whoever listens to us is that it is not, it is not a digital divide, it is a digital bridge. So the goal is that <laughs> tools like this should reduce the literacy divide. The real divide is a literacy divide. That if you if you can't if you don't know how to read, then our claim is that this kind of an interface, or if you're not a proficient reader, this kind of an interface is an easier way for you to vote than to have all that information about exactly these street street names sort of uh, presented to you in an order saying, if you vote for 10%, this street gets resurfaced. If you vote for 20%, this other street also gets resurfaced. <laughs> 
So this is one big challenge trying to convince uh, cities and states that these tools are not going to decrease uh, um, <coughs> um, is not going to sort of make the literacy divide worse. <laughs> then sort of as you are voting you can see <laughs> uh, you can see what you are voting on and as you can see this is an approval vote. You can select up to four things. <laughs> Uh, you can also select how much money you want to spend on <coughs> on each uh, uh, on, on the street resurfacing, <laughs> but there is no connection between uh, how much money you are spending and what you are voting on. <laughs> Sorry, how, how much money, there is no connection between, uh, there is no restriction on how much money you, you are allowed to spend, it is only like how many projects you are allowed to choose. And so that leads us to one big problem with the approval voting, which is that there is no <laughs> recognition of trade offs. So there is no, the, so we feel it is a wrong question to ask is it better to build a, build a fountain in a park or fill a portal on a street? Okay. Because it is not clear how you would answer that question, that is not the way we make decisions in our, in our life. Uh, the right question to ans ask is, is it better to build a fountain for 10k or fill a portal for 1k? And that is when we can all make these value for money decisions that we that we are used to making in our own life, right. <coughs> so approval voting does not actually force anyone to recognize any trade offs because you can vote for whichever four projects you want and you, you do not have to recognize that some of them might be more expensive than others. <laughs> and then the exchange ex incentives. So imagine you go to a race and there is a horse that you really, really, really want to win that is your favorite horse. <laughs> you also have insider information knowing that horse is actually going to win. <laughs> so that is the horse you who is your favorite and you know is going to win would you ever bet on anyone else? <laughs> and the answer is no, there is no incentive for you to vote in, bet on anyone else, but that can happen with approval voting. <laughs> so there can, there exist cases where a voter should vote for A over B, if, they, if a self interest voter should vote for A over B, even if she prefers B and B is winning. <laughs> and that is a, that's a, that's a sort of bizarre kind of incentive that gets set up and one way of thinking about this is, <laughs> you know you have, you can vote on two things or you can, let us say you can only vote on one thing and you know Medicare is winning anyway. So why vote for Medicare, let us forget about Medicare, let us go and vote for something else. <laughs> so those kinds of strange incentives uh, uh, <coughs> make this, uh, make it very non-obvious what it really means to aggregate, uh, uh, how to aggregate these votes <laughs> and then also we do not feel is the, wrong, is the right question. <laughs> so in fact we feel like all these participatory budget, all budgets are like knapsack a knapsack processes. Right? So in the knapsack problem, you are given a knapsack, it is a fixed capacity and you are given a bunch of goods, each good has a value and a size and you want to pack as much value into your knapsack without exceeding the capacity, okay? that is the standard knapsack problem. <laughs> All budget problems except the federal, except the federal budget are knapsack voting <laughs> because in states for example in California, uh, you cannot exceed the revenue that you have. In cities like San Francisco, you cannot even have revenue measures in, as part of the budget. <laughs> so if San Francisco wants to raise revenue, it has to be a separate process. The budget is sort of like a fixed amount of money and you are trying to pack something into it. <laughs> All the participatory budgeting processes that cities have run that we know of have a fixed part of money that we are putting things into. <laughs> so all of these are like really like knapsack boards. Uh, was the right way to solve a knapsack board, a knapsack problem? Was the optimum solution to a knapsack problem? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Suppose you have to worry about the edge effect, so it is NP hard because of the edge effect because you cannot choose things fractionally. <laughs> so the right thing to do is to arrange your items in decreasing order of value per pound <laughs> okay. and then just pick start picking from the top of the pile and dumping them into your knapsack till your knapsack becomes full and that ends up being the optimum solution to the knapsack problem. <laughs> so, so immediately this budgeting problem now gets reduced to a ranking problem and the ranking problem is where you are not ranking by value and you are not ranking by money, you are ranking by value for money. <laughs> and so that is the next thing we did. So for example, this is not, this is not a part of the ballot. What I showed you before was the actual ballot that was used by Chicago and a similar ballot was used by Valleyho last month. <laughs> what I am showing you now is, a, is an interface, is, a, is an experiment that we do. So after people are done with their actual ballot, we ask them to play around as a survey like, like an IRB approved survey. 
and we ask them which project gives the best value for the money <laughs> and people have a very hard time assigning value to these kinds of things it's very hard to say what's the value to the community for it from replacing the carpet i mean no nobody knows what that value is but people find it very easy to make these value for money comparisons <laughs> so that's something we have consistently found that it actually takes people less time to breeze through these value for money comparisons <laughs> then it does for them to choose four things that they want to vote on <laughs> So we are not asking them what the value of, ca of a carpet is or what the value for the fountain is. We are telling them what the costs are and then we say which of these projects gives better value of money to the Vallejo community or the Chicago community. <laughs> and the claim is because the optimum solution to the knapsack problem is to pick things in decreasing order of value for money. If we can extract that societal ranking of value for money then we have an optimum solution to the knapsack problem. So, uh, so in addition, we get some other nice properties. Which uh, so we have made some pro some progress on strategy proofness. So you want to make sure that at least this kind of this bizarre thing doesn't happen. <laughs> that <laughs> this voter this this voter prefers B and B is winning, but she votes for A. So that's that's the that's the that's the very minimum uh, kind of bizarre behavior you want to eliminate. And something which doesn't have that behavior, where if you prefer something and the something is winning, you will vote for it. That is what we call weak strategy proofness. <laughs> so, you are not always, always going to be truthful, but when the thing that you prefer is already winning, you are going to be truthful. <laughs> and so, the basic idea of trying to get strategy, strategy proofness is to make voters rec recognize trade offs. <laughs> so, if we ask users to submit an entire budget, <laughs> so instead of asking them to choose uh, four proposals, four projects which may or may not add up to, which may exceed the budget, which may be under the budget. <laughs> We ask them for an entire solution to an asset problem. So we say, just make the whole budget. Tell us exactly what what you'll pick without exceeding a million dollars, which is the which is the uh, budget amount. <laughs> then the best response by a user to everyone else's vote is weekly strategy proof. If something is winning and you want it to win, you'll vote for it. If I know that something is going to get funded no matter what I do, yeah. then why not include it? Then why include it in my budget? I know it's going to happen, so I can I can sort of spend my special interest money on other stuff because <laughs> you have to give an entire solution so you might say well i want i want this other thing to win <laughs> so you might vote for it <laughs> but that entire thing can't be the whole of the knapsack <laughs> so let's say i want i want a million dollars to go to medicare and i want a million dollars to go to <laughs> let's say gun control <laughs> yeah let's say drug enforcement <laughs> i really really like medicare <laughs> but i know that if i don't vote for drug enforcement it's not going to win <laughs> So I might vote for drug enforcement, but I have to fill the whole knapsack, they are 2 million dollars. So even after I vote for drug enforcement, there is still money left to fill. So I might as well also vote for the thing that I really like, which is Medicare. So if I am an issue public, right? like I only care about drug enforcement, like that is the one thing that I care about this, in this election, why not? If that is the only thing you care about, this doesn't apply to you. So we are not trying to do social engineering in the sense we do not, whatever you believe is ground truth, what you care about is what you care about. When we say strategy proof, we are not saying, we are not saying you have to somehow think about everybody else. <laughs> All we are saying is if, if you want something to win and that thing is winning, then you should not vote against it. <laughs> so maybe, it's, uh, so, so let us say, it's, 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 uh, let's, say there, let's say you can, let us say, let us say your NASA capacity is 2 okay. and currently Medicare is winning and uh, um, gun control is winning. Now, for you, what your preferences are Medicare and drug enforcement. If you can only vote for one thing, you might go and vote for drug enforcement even though you like Medicare better. And even the Medicare is winning. But if you have to submit a, an entire solution to the whole problem, then you still want both these things to win, so you will say bo let both of them win. So you will go and vote for drug enforcement and then you will also go and vote for Medicare. I agree with the like, If well, I have two uh, really expensive things I want and I can't get both of those and Medicare and I know Medicare is going to win anyway, then I would vote for... Oh, so the thing is when, when I describe this NAPSAC voting thing, there is something I, I uh, uh, slipped under the rug. And the thing that I slipped under the rug is I said assume you can vote for things uh, fractionally. So the whole knapsack voting problem becomes uh, 
NP hard uh, when you are uh, when you have to either choose an entire thing or not choose an entire thing. <coughs> so I am assuming here that you can have continuous choices. <laughs> so I am assuming that you can choose things fractionally. So what would happen then? <coughs> so if, if there is only 2 million dollars and this costs 1.5 and what you would prefer to do is to spend 1.5 million here and half a million here, that is exactly what you will vote for. <coughs> you will say let me vote for the for 1.5 million for drug enforcement and then the remaining half a million you still have to park somewhere. This one you hate, so there is no way you are going to vote for this. And so Medicare is what you really want to win, so you will vote, you will put half a million of that in Medicare. <coughs> so that is the theorem, so. <coughs> but the theorem is very delicate, it's, 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 it only works if you are, if you are asked to give an entire solution to the whole knapsack problem. <coughs> if there is a mismatch, for example, the entire budget is 10 million. And I tell you, well, why don't you tell me how to spend 5 million of this money? Then the weak strategy improvements goes away. <coughs> because then what you exactly what you are saying happens. If I say the entire budget is 10 million, why don't you tell me how to spend 20 million? Then again the strategy improvements goes away. <coughs> so it only works, it only works if you if you if you are asked to solve exactly the knapsack problem that the that the system is trying to solve. <coughs> and you also get uh, strategy proofness. If instead of just asking, so th this thing which, which I showed before where you ask people to compare two things, that unfortunately is not weakly strategy proof. <laughs> but if you ask users to choose two projects to compare, so you tell them you choose which two projects you want to compare and then compare them. <laughs> so an example would be you go to a committee meeting and some things are winning and you say no, no I do not want that thing to win, Put the, I want this thing to win instead. <laughs> so if, if, if you ask users to choose which two projects to compare then this thing becomes weakly strategy proof. <laughs> And so the big open problem here is that while I said that we are going to do, we are going to get uh, uh, weak strategy proofness for an individual, we did not make any claims about this optimal, this ranking that we get, also somehow approximating societal value. And so, so that is going to be like the next part of the talk. So uh, this, this part of the talk is sort of very, is very practical in the sense that the next goal for us in participatory budgeting in our platforms is to convince a city to go all digital, to not have a paper ballot. <laughs> if they do not have a paper ballot, then we can design the digital ballot the way we want to design it. <laughs> and then we can really sort of get away from approval voting. The reason to do approval voting is because anything else is very hard to do with a paper ballot. <laughs> On a paper ballot, you can say go and choose four things. On a paper ballot, you cannot go and cannot ask people to say go and choose whatever you want, but it has to add up to no more than a million dollars. I mean, they are going to just sit there with the calculator and never get done. <laughs> so, so I think once we go away from a paper ballot, that is our next goal and we are getting some good traction with some cities, some cities at least on a pilot. If there is no paper ballot, if there is just our system, then we can design the way we like. And we really, and so these kinds of, these kinds of theorems are really sort of uh, effective in the sense that we, we are proving them because we need to understand how to design the system. <laughs> what I am describing next is a bit more hypothetical. So this would be a good time, what time should I stop? Five past, so two o'clock. Okay, <laughs> I'm not sure I have that many slides. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> You're welcome. I'm sure everyone will be very disappointed if you. Uh, <laughs> so the next thing is, uh, so the next thing, want to, so the next thing we want to understand is how to do large scale decision making via small group interaction. <laughs> and so here our goal indeed is to maximize some sort of societal value. So the objective is going to be to find something which is in some sense good for the whole society. <laughs> so this is a famous example run by uh, Francis Galton. He went to a fair and he asked people to guess the weight of an ox <laughs> and everyone sort of came up with their own estimates and it turned out that the median of these estimates was actually uh, pretty close to the actual weight, actual vote, actual weight of the ox. And so he wrote a nice paper <coughs> called Vox Populi and he somehow the inference that he drew is that the median <coughs> of a bunch of opinions is actually a good uh, reflection of uh, uh, what is optimum or what is uh, what the society should do. <coughs> and the reason is because the mean is very susceptible to outliers whereas the median is not the susceptible to outliers. Right? If I an outlier you can move wherever you want and the median will not change. Let's also assume that they were talking to each other they were all farmers who knew how to weigh an ox. Like, this is important about that that result. If if right, if we if you ask us to weigh the ox, we would be horrible at it. 
<laughs> in fact, the only time I've been able to get this to work recently is getting a bunch of faculty to, to guess like the flight time between two places in the United States because they spend so much time in the air. You've actually done this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, guess, guess how many jelly beans are in the jar? I've never gotten a class to do this very well. Because we're, just, we're not built to reason that way very well. And, and the, the property that, that, this was, uh, that was remarkable was that the medium was more accurate than the closest guess. I see. And that's not, not the case with like the jelly bean guessing. Uh, but was the case, I think, with the flights, maybe. Anyway, it's, it's, it's an interesting... Okay, how is the medium closer? In the closest guess? That was, so yeah. Galton actually studied both the average and the median, and I think he published it differently in different Yeah, so I think that the median was better than the mean. Better than the mean. Yes. Okay, that makes more sense. Yeah. Because it should be, the closest guess should always be as good or better than the median. Mm-hmm. Let's just do votes. Yeah, and, and let's see yes. some weird edge case, but yeah. So the question is, can you do this to more complex things? So the ox is like a nice number, the jelly means are a nice number, <laughs> but how, how would you do it to more complex decisions? <laughs> uh, like for example, what's the ideal way to regulate off-road traffic? <laughs> and you can still imagine that people still have, <laughs> you can imagine that these opinions still lie in some space, they may not lie, lie on a line. <laughs> Let's assume these opinions lie in some abstract space. <laughs> and so you can still define the median. And the generalized median, or, or called the geometric median, or just, uh, the one median, I just, you just call it the median, <laughs> is the point in a space which minimizes the sum of the distances from the point to everybody else. <laughs> so just like the mean <laughs> minimizes the sum of the squares of the distances from that point to everybody else. You know, when the median is just something which minimizes the sum of the distances from that point to everybody else. And, and, and the reason they call it the generalized median is because that's exactly that in one dimension the two de definitions exactly coincide. <laughs> so in this case for example, let's imagine that our opinions are structured on a tree and like I said this part is sort of more hypothetical. <laughs> so it's not going to be people voting in Chicago on budgets, it's going to be like abstract entities where their opinion spaces form a tree and or they, they space on a grid and we're trying to aggregate them. <laughs> so let's assume that these, these blobs here are actually people <laughs> and and they and where I've placed them on this tree depends on where their opinion lies on the tree. And let's let's assume everyone's opinion is a point on a tree. <laughs> In this case, this guy would end up being the median. <laughs> okay. So the, the median is generally well defined in all spaces. On a tree, it's particularly easy. On a tree, the median is sort of like Uh, a median is just this node which is sort of half the people on this side and half the people on that side. For example, where you have subcases. So imagine you have a binary classification, you have many, many, many cases. <laughs> and you could imagine that the biggest thing for, you, for people to decide <laughs> is whether to hire in systems or in theory. <laughs> People who want to hire in systems might want to hire in networking or in, uh, I'm sure it's the faculty search season, so I apologize for the example. <laughs> People who want to uh, hire in systems are going to either hire a security person <coughs> or a networking person. People who want to hire a security person might want to hire someone who does uh, uh, security, someone who does mobile security versus someone who does enterprise security. <laughs> And then you have a similar chain on theory. So when, whenever you have these spaces which are going to, these preference spaces which are going to, get, going to get partitioned finer and finer, there's a higher level distinction. And then within these two, like between Democrats and Republicans, when Republicans, they are mainstream Republicans and Tea Party Republicans. And then Tea Party Republicans, they're like people of this type versus that type. Like, wouldn't the internal nodes in that case be like abstract classes? Like they can't, there's no single candidate that instantiates that idea. You could, you could actually have, uh, yeah, there could be, yeah, that's right. So you could actually, you could actually have a tree which is sort of more like a, yeah, would be abstract nodes which don't actually instantiate an idea, that's correct. <laughs> In this particular example, but that doesn't mean there couldn't be another example. There couldn't be another person which says, no, let's just hire a system, the best systems guy. It doesn't matter which area they come from. <laughs> the tree itself kind of, kind of like structuring the vote itself because, because they're saying that like, that's no, so the, the, the question is, the goal is to extract the median without constructing the tree. 
So I think that the so so this is this is this is so we are assuming that opinions come from some space. <laughs> we might assume that opinions come on a tree, but the process that we are going to describe doesn't use the tree. Doesn't no one has to actually specify the tree explicitly. <laughs> And the theorems that we describe might be true only if the opinions come from a tree, <laughs> but the process you could run on anything. <laughs> it might not give you desirable results <laughs> because our theorems were not hold, <laughs> uh, or maybe it might give you desirable results. <laughs> we cannot claim it will give you desirable results. <laughs> Does it make sense? That is the whole point. If we somehow already knew the tree, then there is nothing to do. It generalizes to an if every point in R is fixed. So it generalizes to a grid. It generalizes to a grid as long as a, every point in the grid is filled. If you have a grid with holes, then it doesn't generalize. So it generalizes to like any 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 multidimensional grid, any hypercube, anything which is called a tessellation of the hypercube, not tessellation, a retraction of the hypercube. So it generalizes to a big class, which I'm going to describe. But you can't have holes. So it would not generalize to this case which uh, Michael was concerned about there like this hole in the middle. <laughs> and the idea here is we want, we want, so this is like a complex problem now, so we, want to, we need to go beyond voting. <laughs> and the idea here is that people can do more than just compare proposals. <laughs> uh, they can say things like what proposal is closest to x and between y and z. <laughs> that is the kind of thing you can sort of expect someone to make. <laughs> Like I, I, I want to reconcile like I am x, <laughs> so I want to be as close to where I want to be, but I know that I have to reconcile what uh, you say and what he says because I have to somehow carry the two of you be, along with me. <laughs> so I have to find, I have to find this thing which is sort of like close to some sort of an average of what you are saying, some sort of weighted average of what you are saying, but it is closest to what I want. There is a kind of thing that happens all the time in committees. So, let us assume you can have things like this as a magic box, what proposal is closest to x in between y and z. You can have other things as a magic box. <coughs> and so, the question is can you identify a magic box like this thing will be great if you have and see what you can do. <coughs> okay. uh, and so, the magic box that we are going to assume is that triads can identify that one median. <laughs> we are going to assume that we know where people's opinions lie <laughs> and we are going to assume that we know the structure. We are not even going to assume that people know their structure. We do not even know how people can place their opinions on a space. We are going to assume that given that triads can identify their one median. If I just give you three people, they can together, they might not decide to, they might, I am not saying they will they'll want to do it. I am saying there is some way for them to identify their one median. So, I am going to assume, so this is an example of a reduction. I remember during lunch today, someone was mentioning it will be good to have reductions. So, this is like an example of a reduction. I am saying, suppose you could do this what could you do on top. <laughs> and so, we are going to define this thing called triadic consensus and it is going to look a bit complicated, but the basic idea is the following. We put three people in a room <laughs> uh, and we ask and we ask in the, in the very simplest instance, I am going to show you something more complex. In the very simplest instantiation, we put three people in a room, let us say x, y and z. We ask x, do you like y better or z better? We ask y, do you like x better or z better? We ask z, do you like x better or y better? <laughs> if one person gets two words, we will say yeah, you are the winner. If nobody gets two words, we will say well the three of you can't agree among yourselves, you are probably like one of those people who are going to just like love to disagree, we are kicking all three of you out of this. Okay. <coughs> so, that is that's a very <coughs> that is a very simple way in which you would do it in practice and then we would hope that over time you will have like a bunch of centrist people and ultimately some winner will emerge. <coughs> but what I am going to describe is going to be a more complex process because I ultimately want to prove a theorem about it. Right? <coughs> so, imagine that there is this room. Think of it like caucusing. So, so a lot of a lot of primaries, for example, happen via caucuses. <laughs> in this room, there are all these people, and we want to somehow aggregate their opinion. <laughs> and so we'll take them three by three, <laughs> and we'll take these three, and we say, well, why don't you tell us what your one median is? <laughs> and we assume they can somehow figure out their one median. <laughs> and they'll say, well, they don't really know what tree they are on, but somehow, suppose magically they can figure out their one median. <laughs> We're going to take all three of them out. <laughs> We are going to take this person who is the one median and we will give this person four words. So, we will say by the way you are the one median of this triad, it means you are like a guy who is actually able to have compromise positions. <laughs> we are going to give you, you have one vote already because there is already one of you, we are going to make <coughs> three more copies of you and give you four words. <coughs> then we are going to pick three more people, keep repeating the process <coughs> and at some point <coughs> this box will be of a single color. 
and when this box of a single color that is when we will say well we are done we have consensus. <coughs> Does it make sense? The process I was describing before was a bit more intuitive you ask three people and say <coughs> ask x to vote among y and z, y to vote among x and x and z, z to vote among x and y if one person gets two votes they stay otherwise they get kicked out. <coughs> this process is a bit more <coughs> is a bit more convoluted okay, but not too convoluted. The idea is you put three people in a room you ask them to come up with their one median you take all their votes and put them on the median <coughs> and then you keep and, and, and then you proceed. <coughs> now, but putting them on the median means that someone has to next time you draw a ball someone has to be able to represent that ball. <coughs> okay. So, which is why it is important that there are no holes when they come up with a median the median is actually a position which is held by somebody. <coughs> so, the winner is the remaining color <coughs> and so here is a um, here is an example imagine that your opinions lie on a binary tree of depth a million ok. And so, the question is if I run this process and I want some very high probability that the winner is chosen from the top d levels would I get d equal to 500,000. So, d equal to 500,000 is roughly a square root of the population <laughs> because it is exponential if I take half the levels I get a square root of the population d equal to 1000 which is even is smaller d equal to 20 which is more like the log of the height which is an exponentially small fraction of the population or d equal to 2 okay. like the, 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 the top and the bottom are they are just for distraction ok I am really asking you to choose among b and c. So, the question is what level would the winner would the winner show up? Yeah ultimately there will be only one color left and with and I want to have a very high confidence saying that this this winner is going to be from the top d levels because that is that the median for this binary tree is the guy at the top. And so, at what level will I be able to say confidently that the winner is from the top D levels? So, the answer is actually 2, okay, even though I said it is not a valid answer. You are guaranteed almost certainly with very high probability that when you run this uh, triadic process, the winner is either going to be the median or the two, kid, two children of the median. And, uh, the party that anyone else will emerge as the winner is vanishingly small. So, you will get a really tight really good approximation of the median. <coughs> so, it does not seem like the process I was describing seemed very uh, very loose, but it actually has this very strong property. <coughs> if you have a square grid and you run this process on the square grid <coughs> and the grid is a million and a million wide, then with 99 percent probability the winner is in I cannot play the same trick again. And so, I guess you know that the answer is going to be d equal to 3. <coughs> If you have a million by million grid and you run this process with 99 percent probability the winner is going to be in the center 3 by 3 square. <coughs> so, this this process even though it looks very bizarre has some very strong properties. Okay. In general for any median graph, <coughs> so median graph is any graph where any three you know nodes have a unique median. <coughs> Triadic consensus finds a 1 plus uh, order of square root log n over square root and approximate 1 median in order n log n triads. So, a triad is like how many you, you how many of these decisions need to make. So, you need to do n log n which means on an average a person is involved in log n triads. <laughs> of course, the winner is involved in far far more because the winner just keeps accumulating all the balls. <laughs> but on an average uh, a user is involved in log n triads which is vanishing which is very small <laughs> and you find a 1 plus a small o of 1 approximate 1 median. And so, that is about as good as you could get right I mean it is not like 1 plus epsilon it is not like 2 it is 1 plus small o of 1 <laughs> yeah. Sorry, this is uh, not voting you are just computing a median in this sense is this a particularly good bound or can you do a lot <coughs> If you know the entire space <laughs> um, I did not think about it that way. I have a hard time believing that you could do much better. Like on a number line, you can do better than this. On, on, on a line, you can do it in time order n. Yeah. On a tree, I think you might be able. I'll have to think about. It. You might be able to do it in order n. Or in order n. So. I don't know about R n, but we are we are looking very specifically at these grids, which are with the no holes. On a grid you can do it in time order n because the median on a grid is the median is the coordinate wise median. So, you also will do it there in order n. Uh, yes, I think you can do it in order n. 
So maybe maybe you're losing login because you're running this bizarre uh, triadic scheme. <coughs> but what you're gaining in return is you never actually have to know um, what the space is. And the, and the participants never need to know what their space is. They don't ever need to sort of even they, need to, they don't need to articulate their problem, their space, their position in a very quantitative way. So, for example, in voting, NAFSA voting, you have to lay out your votes. It's a very quantitative, well-defined thing. It could just be an abstract opinion that you're expressing. As long as I can find the one median of three people, I'm okay. <laughs> and a median graph is something where, for any three nodes, a unique median exists. <laughs> so, trees have that property. Grids have that property, hypercube has that property, a bunch of graphs have that property. But anything that has that property, this this, this thing would work. <coughs> now, is this reasonable? So, we said suppose that triads could find their one median, that was the basis for all this. <coughs> is that reasonable? And is that uh, going to somehow be incentive compatible? Maybe they can, but will they? Will they just lie and do something else? <coughs> and so, <coughs> so what we show is another magic box, which is inside this one median magic box which lets you compute the 1 million. <laughs> and that is the box which is the following. <laughs> what proposal is closest to x and between y and z? <laughs> so think about the person who is asking this question is actually x. <laughs> okay. So x is me, I, I, I want something close to me. <laughs> I want to be, I have to be able to ask, understand that if the two of you are, I am in a triad with the two of you, I have to be able to understand what is the position which is very close to my position, but somehow in the middle of what you guys want. <laughs> And if I can answer, if I if I have that magic box, if I can make that judgment, okay, then the computing the one median reduces to this specific magic box, <laughs> and in particular, it reduces this magic box <coughs> in a way in which truth telling becomes a Nash equilibrium. <coughs> so not only will you be able to compute the one median, will you be able to compute the one median in, in a way in which truth telling is a Nash equilibrium? <coughs> if everyone else is telling the truth, you have no incentive to lie. And in particular, it is not just the Nash equilibrium for combining the 1 median, but it is the Nash equilibrium for the entire game, <coughs> for the entire sort of <coughs> the multi period uh, extensive form strategic game. This is a Nash equilibrium. <coughs> so, it is a very powerful property, right? But of course, I mean, <coughs> the <coughs> like all powerful properties, right, it comes with a caveat, and the caveat is it has to be a median graph, and the median graph cannot have any holes. <coughs> so, it has to be like a fully occupied yeah, okay. median graph. <coughs> Can you do it with two people? So we said, okay, let, let's use a triad. Could you have done it with two people? <coughs> so you can imagine instead of putting three people there, right? You're taking two people, <coughs> and these two people are somehow implementing. There's some magic box that these two people can do, and based on that, you're going to do something. <coughs> you're going to find something. You're going to put it back. You want to do exactly what we did with triads. You want to do it with two people, <coughs> and here we can prove that uh, no reasonable pairwise magic box can find an approximate 1 median median graphs. <coughs> so you need at least 3. So you basically need this thing, so intuitively it makes sense, you need this kind of a check on the outlier. <laughs> like x is voting among y and z, z is voting among y and x, y is voting among x and z. <laughs> among the among the triad that acts as the sort of like a check on the outlier. <laughs> and so you need that and if you just pairwise comparisons, if you have just a pair and I am here and then you are there, there is no notion of even trying to figure out what an outlier means. I am here and you are there and these are the only two things in the world, right? So, <laughs> so you can actually show that no pairwise process will actually have the same property, but the triadic process will. <laughs> and this is a bit hypothetical because we, 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 um, we do not really have a system which sort of where we are confident people will have their opinions on a median graph and will play this game. <laughs> uh, but somehow our goal is to <laughs> uh, first get the previous kinds of things that I was mentioning about knapsack voting into real deployments. <laughs> Try to play around with things like this and the grading consensus game that I described before. On a more theoretical level, do experiments in class, maybe in one of your classes. <laughs> and then ultimately, maybe hopefully these kinds of ideas will also find their way into practice. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just trying to chew this through. There's, you're sort of assuming there's this big RN space in which our opinions lie. Or grid, let's say. Or grid, say. Um, I guess regardless, um, what's surprising in a sense about what you're suggesting is that through these pairwise elicitations or triad elicitations, you're in a sense recovering that space, uh, at least enough to determine a winner. 
Just uh, the meeting. I mean, just the meeting. meeting. Yes. Um, I'm trying to chew through whether people's opinions are amenable to that kind of formalization, where like there's these weird folds and like inconsistencies and like discontinuities in our opinions that would make this kind of thing very difficult to, to yeah. project onto a grid. So the, the first thing that I'm describing, that's very easy to do. Is you put three people in a room and ask them to vote for each other. And that we actually tested. <laughs> so not, not at any scale, not at anything like which you would think of as testing, but testing is like a back, an equivalent of a back of the envelope calculation. <laughs> we got eight triads <laughs> and we put, uh, uh, in each triad we put either two Democrats and a Republican or two Republicans and a Democrat. And we asked them to come up with a full, full federal budget. <laughs> and then we asked the Democrat, we asked each of them to vote among the other two without telling them who's the Democrat, who's the Republican. <laughs> And I think in a majority of our triads, the minority guy won. <coughs> and then we, and, and then we took these uh, these winners, and we put them against each other, and we asked them, if we give you enough time, do you think you, the two of you could solve the consensus problem for the budget? And they said yes. <coughs> so, I, so I don't quite. So it's not. <coughs> um, so somehow it also reflects our training, right? In the <coughs> so we, we are sort of more used to proving these theorems. And then on the system side, uh, we have a, it's been hard to conceive of an experiment that would do it. And part of the reason also is that these experiments take effort and uh, we already are doing these deployments in cities. So it's partly also just a matter of uh, finding a couple of willing people who are willing to think through what an experiment with this kind of a theory would look like and actually do it at scale. But 10, 12 percent experiments, these things work very well. For me, sorry, you can jump in. Sorry, I'm yeah, just. Uh, I was just wondering uh, if you're coming to this medium opinion, uh, will it just make like the people that are really close to it happy and the majority not as happy? You know, would it be? So I think that's the difference between personalization and uh, democracy. <coughs> so in a separate life, uh, I do a lot of research on personalization, but here you have to come with a single decision. So if you have to come with a single decision, people are going to be unhappy. <laughs> and uh, in a way, the way the median is defined, <coughs> a median is defined precisely to minimize the total amount of unhappiness. <coughs> so if you think of the median, the median is the point which if you choose that median, and if you, if you think of this distance, so I was calling it a distance, it's very abstract. Let's think of it as my unhappiness, my frustration. <laughs> so the distance between x and xj says that if my, my opinion is x, and those stupid voters out there go and vote for XJ, how unhappy am I going to be? <laughs> That's exactly what we mean by distance. So in a way the median, so in, in democracy there is no way to eliminate that unhappiness and the median is precisely the point which minimizes the sum of the unhappiness. <laughs> there are some things maybe, to maybe get this a little more precise, where I feel like a lot of people will attach infinite unhappiness to them. Um, so like I, I think, I feel like a lot of the rhetoric in politics is basically like, Think of pro-life versus pro-choice. Like people attach very, very strong opinions to this. I, but I wonder if it might be possible through some of the elicitation techniques you're talking about. Like, would you give up having a crime system if you know, like, or a, a justice system entirely in order to have your way on this? Like, you might be able to actually project it back into some sort of continuous yeah. space. So our goal for now is to avoid those kinds of problems. <laughs> <laughs> We so we, 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 we're not, we're not sort of, it's not our ambition in any way in the short term to use this system to solve the Arab-Israeli conflict. <laughs> and so, <laughs> uh, but just on a, so, yeah, so those things clearly exist. <laughs> and it's clear there sort of that there's no, <laughs> they're not amenable to a, a democratic process. <laughs> and it's not clear what to do. One, one thing that we have found is often one of the advantages, one of the big advantages of doing something like this is that people themselves are forced to reconcile their own inner differences. <coughs> now I do not quite know how to put that in a theorem, so maybe that is something that more like people like you can think about. <coughs> For example, in San Francisco, a majority of San Franciscans hold the following three opinions at the same time. <coughs> at the same time, <coughs> one opinion is we are a compassionate city, so we do not we don't want any poor person to lose housing. <coughs> we, are, we are an environmental city, so we do not want to do any environmental damage by building new buildings. And we are in the center of this thriving economy, so we want to benefit from that by having a higher, big revenue base and having companies come to San Francisco. <laughs> and they hold all three of these opinions at the same time. <laughs> and you can hold a politician accountable 
but it's very hard to go and hold uh, this random guy on the street accountable saying are you crazy how can you always vote <coughs> for all three of these things at the same time whenever an initiative comes up. <coughs> so part of that is so the way I focus the, the way I formulate the problem <coughs> it was seen very much like <coughs> we are trying to do some big uh, opinion aggregation. <coughs> But I think a bigger contribution might be just to force people to say this is what I want to do about the San Francisco housing crisis. <laughs> and so somehow uh, when people make a budget, <laughs> so the reason cities love this <laughs> is then there is a fixed budget and people have to come and express their preferences in that fixed budget <laughs> and they cannot go and then come and complain well why did not that thing happen because it did not happen because they did not win and did not win because there was not enough money. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.